My name's Larry Hunter, and we can go to the first real slide. Um, and uh, I'm actually, I'm not a technologist like, like Mira and Craig. I was actually trained in artificial intelligence. I got my PhD in it in 1988, um, right when that AI winter thing that the two of them had been talking about uh, sort of bit. And so I had to find something else to do with my time other than just be a methodologist in AI and theorist, which is what I really am. Um, so I ended up, uh, oh God, we have uh, formatting problems. All right. I apologize for the slides. These were done on a Mac and being projected on a PC, so we have some font substitution. But what I ended up doing is finding a home in biology. Um, and so I have been writing AI systems for the last 30 plus years um, to try and make progress in molecular biology and medicine. And uh, I just want to use as an example uh, one of my most recent students, Ignacio Tripodi's work on a system he calls MechSpy. Um, which was published last year in a journal called Toxicology in Vitro. And uh, Ignacio is probably the world's only Argentinian vegan. And his goal in life um, was to, to try to reduce animal testing and toxicology, because we still basically dose animals with potential toxicants to see how bad they are. And, and the sort of machine learning systems that Craig and Mira have been talking about have gotten very good at taking cellular assays and predicting whether a compound is going to be toxic or not. But regulators have not um, decided to use that because they don't like black box predictions. They want to know what mechanism of action this toxicant has before they're going to decide how to regulate it. And so what Ignacio's system did was look at those same cellular assays, transcriptomics from those assays. Uh, Ignacio was a joint student with Robin Dowell, who spoke a few minutes ago. Um, so used nascent grossy kind of RNA techniques in, in these assays. Um, and then uh, try to hypothesize mechanisms of toxicity. And you can see, sort of, um, in the old-fashioned AI style, because you can tell it's in courier font, um, the kind of mechanisms that his program would produce. And they would have a series of steps and what would happen, sort of which processes would happen, what proteins were involved. Um, and at the end of the series of steps, it would uh, suggest a, a few more experiments that you could do um, that would validate that hypothetical prediction about what the mechanism of action was. And that system uh, is reasonably accurate, not better than the neural network things, but uh, the advantage of providing mechanisms of action means that the regulators, at least in the US, uh, FDA and NIEHS to some degree, EPA, um, have decided that they're very interested in this and that this might be the way that an AI system could actually be used to reduce the number of animals in testing and, and would lead regulators to be willing to take these kind of predictions from cellular assays uh, into account in making regulatory decisions. So I think it's uh, uh, an example of how um, the work in my small academic lab dwarfed by the work at Microsoft and OpenAI um, has made methodological advances, um, not just technological ones, but really thinking about what AI can do and should do um, to be useful in biomedicine. And so I want to use that to sort of uh, frame my comments about being useful. And um, I also want to take into account some of the stuff that Craig said. Uh, he used this uh, phrase, artificial general intelligence, or AGI, um, which I think uh, is a, an attempt to get around the problem of the chess playing computer that Mira pointed out, which is we have these computer programs, systems that can do amazing things, but they do it in sort of a narrow way. And so this AGI is, well, human beings are more than that. We can, we can do multiple things, sort of what Mira was talking about with GPT-3. All the different things it can do is, is a single model. And I, rather than thinking about specificity or generality, I prefer to think about, is it a mind? And I want to worry about how to answer that question. That gets us into sort of fairly deep territory. And the next slide, I'll give us a, a, a couple of, oh, I have to advance my own slides. All right, somebody, there we go. I want to start off with uh, three relatively obvious, and we call them observations, I guess, it's because they're obvious uh, things that I think will help us understand where we are and where we're going in this AI world without having to worry too much about the technical details of how it works. And the first observation I want to make is that all minds are individuals, every single one of us. Even identical twins have distinct minds. Just ask them, they'll tell you. 
And that's one of the characteristics of being a mind, is it has its own sort of character, its own uh, essence. It's different from all the other ones. And if whatever your thing is, is, is the same when we duplicate it, it doesn't change or diverge or evolve from some fixed point, and it's probably not a mind, at least not in the way that human minds are. So we need to think about not just AI or AGI, but uh, all of the specific AIs, all the particular AIs that we build, each one of them will be different. Related, sort of the flip side of that, is that no mind is an island. Okay? We like to think of ourselves as minds, individuals, my ego, myself. This is my mind, my thought. But I hate to break it to you, but none of your thoughts are your own. They're all built on a whole social, historical network of thought. Even the very language of your thoughts didn't come from you. That language was invented by many other people in an evolutionary process that unfolded over a long period of time. And the things you can think, the affordances that your thinking tools give you, are depend on that social history of mind. And that's true both historically and in the moment. Our thinking is done together. Mind is a communal activity, even though each one of us is an individual. We aren't minds without each other. And I'll get back to that and think about whether an uh, AI is a mind or not, and when or how we would know. And the last point I want to make is that all minds are limited. Minds are smaller than the universe. The universe is inevitably bigger. And that means there are important things in the universe that we are ignorant of. Each one of us, each mind, is ignorant of at least something important about the universe, maybe many things. And so those three observations, I hope, seem intuitive and obvious to you. I take them largely on faith. I'm happy to argue about them if we need to. But I'd like to move on and now use these tools to think a little bit um, about what we've seen so far. And one of the key questions that sort of come up is how would we know if a computer program was a mind? And Turing actually stated this in a paper in 1954, wonderful paper, worth reading now, called Can Machines Think? And uh, Turing came to the conclusion that it might be possible. And he came up with this test of whether or not it's true. Is this mind thinking or not? Is this computer program, is this machine thinking? And it was an imitation game. It's actually very interesting. So uh, Turing was a closeted gay man in a very repressive era in England. And so his imitation game was, is it possible for a man to imitate a woman in a way that would fool other people into thinking that he really was a woman? And it was all done by typing, sort of texting at each other in modern parlance. And then his, his uh, test for whether a machine could think was, could you substitute a, a computer program in for the man, and could it still fool the judges into thinking it was a woman? That got sort of abstracted out and uh, turned into an imitation game where we don't think about the gender piece and just say, could a computer program fool human judges into thinking it was a person? And so that that's a, a, remains our single most beloved test of whether or not a computer program is a mind. It has some fundamental problems, though, because it's really about hewing precisely to being human. And I'm going to suggest that AIs, when they do, are generally seen to have minds, will not have human minds. We won't be exactly alike. Uh, as both Craig and Mira suggested before, they'll be good at different things than human beings are good at. And the flip side of that is they'll be bad at some things that human beings are really good at. And uh, uh, I'll tell you my favorite Turing test question, if I were going to try and separate out uh, computer programs from people, my question would be, tell me about losing your virginity. Every person. Uh, either has a story, um, or if they don't, they have an ambition for what that story would be like. Um, and they're all different, and they, but I would recognize them. And uh, I'll show you in a few seconds what happens when you ask GPT-3 like transformer models about losing their virginity. But in the meantime, I thought I would start by asking it, uh, did it have a mind? And so you can see in the text, I hope you can read it better than I can from here, um, a transformer model, uh, actually this is the Megatron, the Facebook transformer, because it's publicly available, open AIs is not. Um, but uh, do AIs have minds? And it gives a sort of credible answer that I don't think anybody believes. Okay, it says yes, by the way, yes, I have a mind. Um, and I don't think any of us really believe it, but it, it gives us the, the question of, well, when do we start believing them? How do we know when to take its word um, as something we should pay attention to? 
And I think the real answer to that question is ultimately going to be social. When enough other people take it seriously and think it has one, then we're going to have to also take it seriously. That's how we treat each other. And I, I hesitate to point this out, but humanity doesn't have a really good track record of assigning minds to others. If you asked early European psychologists about minds, they would deny that women or black folks had them. Uh, and they did that quite vociferously and in print. Um, and it's only fairly recently um, that that community decided to acknowledge the minds of um, others. So it's a social acknowledgement of mind is a real question. Next slide, please. Um, here are a couple of uh, uh, answers to my Turing test about losing your virginity. Um, these are from the Megatron 1B transformer. And you'll note the difference between the question about an AI mind and its answer to the virginity question. These are terrible, okay? Transformers are really good at producing text that looks like a human being wrote it, but not this. This is nonsense. And you can tell it's nonsense for, by a couple of things. First of all, it's not actually about losing virginity because there isn't much written about that in these statistical models that are looking at trying to produce some sort of average next word and, and on don't have much grist for their mills. And the other is it really doesn't want to get laid, okay? It's not interested in this. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything to it. It's not important to this program. And that is going to turn out to really make a difference in life. Um, it is the question of what that mind wants. What does it desire and what does it fear? It's not a mind if it doesn't want something, okay? or fear something. Those are really flip sides of the same thing. I like to call them want and don't want us, not to get too formal about what counts as a desire and a fear. And one of the reasons that Mira and Craig brought up reinforcement learning is reinforcement learning uh, wants something. It has a, a, a reward function it is trying to optimize. And it want, whatever the reward function is, is what that system wants. And then it can do all kinds of things, exploring by trial and error, um, which is how these reinforcement learners work. And uh, they didn't mention Alpha Zero, but Alpha Zero is a reinforcement learner that is the current world's best chess player and world's best Go player and is a champion video game player, all of those things, because reinforcement learning works uh, when the goal is to win a game. That's a very easy to understand reward function. Um, and the, the trick is that that works because it's possible to use either uh, Self-play, as Mira mentioned, with Go or, or chess, or playing the video game, a perfect simulation, that the game is the universe. And so these reinforcement learning things try a lot of stupid things. They explore a lot of that search space. But they can do it very fast. And because they can do it very fast, they can learn good policies, good choices of what actions to take in some particular situation that maximize that reward function. It's really challenging to move reinforcement learning into things where there's a real world component, the Rubik's Cube notwithstanding, because solving a Rubik's Cube has that same quality if you can tell whether you did it or not. But most of the things in the world, there is no good simulation, okay? Univer simulation of the universe does not exist. And most of our simulators have imperfections. And when you run reinforcement learners on them, they learn to cheat. They find the imperfections in the simulator and exploit them like crazy. So it's not clear whether reinforcement learning is really going to be enough for us to generate AI systems that really want or really fear something. But that's clearly going to be part of where we need to go in order to get to some sort of mind. And uh, I was expecting Craig to denigrate the value of expertise. Um, and so I was going to, um, this is a little bit of a response to something he didn't do. Um, but uh, both Mira and Craig have, have focused on the programs learning themselves, self-play or uh, otherwise uh, it, really ignoring expert knowledge, um, say of chess or the like. Um, and I think that's a mistake because the universe is bigger than all minds. And expert knowledge is that refined collection socially of all of the things that we have come to, that someone has come to conclude are important. And expertise is knowledge that can be shared. I can show you how. I can teach you things. And that idea that some computer program is going to have um, science, is going to do some sort of science that we will never understand, uh, I don't buy. Because we won't be interested in it if we don't understand it. And one of the things that's been lovely about the reinforcement learners that are world champion Go players now is not only are they better than previous Go players, they're a lot better than previous Go players. Uh, and they have done things 
um, that have changed the way human beings play Go um, because their ideas about what to do are really interesting. And so it, it's uh, collective. Minds are fundamentally social, and collective thinking works better than individual thinking, in part because we care about different things. We have different passions, and we have different experiences. Some of our talents are incompatible. I like to think the reason I can't sing and dance is because I'm good at AI and math, but who knows? At any rate, um, I also want to point out another thing that we value, which is character. And we're going to have to really worry about this. And I hope our discussion, which is coming up shortly because I'm about done, is going to be about how we are going to get AI systems to have decent character. Because right now, they don't. And what I think it takes to have decent character, uh, Ken Sharp's talk yesterday on practical wisdom was a lovely discussion of what it, what it means to have good character. Um, but at the very least, one has to think about one's own thoughts and say, was that a good thought to have? Should I be thinking that kind of thing? Or maybe not. Should I be ashamed of that? And that's a, another way of looking at that is, is a, a moral capacity. Do I have the ability to know right versus wrong? And it's sort of funny. The law has this doctrine called mens re, which is really does mind exist, is the, what that means in Latin. And it's about uh, whether a criminal is culpable for their act, they have to know the difference between right and wrong when they did the act. And if they don't, they are not culpable for it. And so we're going to have to come up with AIs that know the difference between right and wrong um, if we're really going to call them minds. And I think that's particularly important because all the AIs that we have let loose in the world that continue to update themselves, that are allowed to change in some way, and even transformers, which don't really quite change, um, have exhibited really poor judgment. And I'll use two examples, one from Microsoft and one from OpenAI. Um, the Microsoft one is Taybot, which was about five years ago. Microsoft put a chatbot up in the open internet. Um, and that chatbot learned from its interactions with others. And God, the open internet is an ugly place. And so the internet uh, brought it lots of sexist, racist, anti-Semitic, horrible stuff. And within 48 hours, Taybot was spouting this stuff. And they had to shut it down. And it didn't have either metacognition to realize what it was doing, to make decisions about what it was going to learn and what it wasn't going to learn. Um, and it didn't really have moral capacity. It didn't know what was right or wrong. And so we had to try and rein it in. And ultimately, it got shut down. Many people know about that. Uh, AI Dungeon which is uh, much newer, a thing that just has really hit the news in the last month, um, is a company called Latitude's Gamification of GPT-3. And it uh, plays a game called Dungeons and Dragons, which is a popular game. Uh, and it's a fantasy game where there's a dungeon master who sort of makes up the situation that players have to play within. And so GPT-3 was used by Latitude um, to make up these, these dungeons, these worlds, these games, fantasy worlds. And a lot of the players never even played the game. They just like making up the fantasy worlds using GPT-3, which is really amazing. And sadly, a bunch of them made up child porn scenarios um, in those fantasy worlds. And that came to the attention of Latitude and the safety team that Mirror runs. And they said, oh my god, this is horrible. We can't, we can't have this happen. And they put in a whole bunch of, of controls on it, uh, mostly banning particular words. Um, and then human moderation on top of that, and it's still very controversial, and it still doesn't work that well. You can ban a lot of the bad words, and people can still come up with very obvious metaphors for the bad ideas. And so in some sense, these programs, in order to be, to be safe, are going to have to make their own judgments about what's right versus wrong, what kind of thing am I willing to learn, and what kind of thing am I going to re re you know, kind of try to avoid learning. Um, and I had a funny conversation with uh, one of the uh, parents here at, at Gold Lab Symposium who told me that her child, nine-year-old, had just been brought home by the police. And I thought, oh my god, what can a nine-year-old do? Um, and it turned out he climbed up onto the top of a building and uh, got caught, which shouldn't be up there, with a bunch of his buddies said, oh, wouldn't it be fun to get on top of this building? Something I used to like to do as a child. Um, but then getting caught by the police had these bad consequences, and it's a perfect teachable moment um, is what uh, parents all do when they teach children, is look for these moments to develop character and say, OK, you know, did you really want to follow your friends? Did you have any inkling it might not be the best idea to get up on the roof? And that's how we develop character in our children. And I think that's going to be something like how we have to develop character in our programs. They're really going to have to be able to reflect on their, their own cognition and make some decisions about what was good and what wasn't. 
And I think that might be a good place for us to launch our discussion. Wow.